This is the American Law Journal. The I Heart Boobies matter is all the rage in Pennsylvania, but could this case go to the U.S. Supreme Court and decide what one noted writer has called it, the fate of free speech for students nationally? Good evening, I'm Christopher Naught, and welcome to ALJ, and this week, I Heart Boobies, you in Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and the East Coast, you know all about this case, the Supremes may know about it sometime soon. What's the storied history of free speech and student First Amendment rights? Could this case be a part of that legacy? Three great guests with me tonight, two in the studio, one joining us from the CNN studios in Washington, D.C. Let's go ahead and meet them. John Freund is with us with King Spry, Herman Freund and Fall. He's chair of the Education Law Practice Group at King Spry, and he's here tonight because he's the solicitor for the Eastern Area Schools, and he's been litigating this case since day one, as has Mary Catherine Roper. She's with the ACLU in Philadelphia, and we've seen her interviewed, much like John, on mass media and major media across the country. And uh, joining us from the CNN studios in Washington, D.C., is Frank Lamont. He is the executive director for the Student Press Law Center in Arlington, Virginia. Well, here in the studio, Mary Catherine, John, meet each other, greet each other. Have, I, I, you guys know each other? I, we, we know I, each other well at I this point. I think that this is the fourth time on this case. <laughs> yes, sorry. Yeah, so let's go back. I mean, again, people watching in Pennsylvania, New Jersey, in, in our region, they know full well what's gone on here, more or less, that two students come to school, they have an I Heart Boobies wristband, more or less, they're told, take it off. They don't. They're kicked out of school or suspended, right? ACLU files a lawsuit, goes to a district court, which is the trial court, federal court in Pennsylvania. Mary Catherine, ACLU, and your clients win. They challenge that. John's group challenges that. Goes up to the Third Circuit, which, as we know, watching this program, one step below the Supremes. Third Circuit basically affirms what you guys had been saying all along. So now, We've come to find out, we read in the newspaper, John Freund, 7-1, the Board of Trustees, the Eastern Area School Board, wants the Supremes to, to pick this case up. How does that even work? I thought the Supremes chose you. You don't choose the Supremes. Yeah. Well, as I've explained to a number of people since this case has come down, Chris, we have a system of constitutional interpretation that does not uh, come down from the top. It kind of bubbles up from the bottom. Uh, and uh, the Supreme Court, for the most part, has a jurisdiction which they choose. They choose their own cases for the most part. Basically, they look at, you know, the novelty of the case, the importance of the issue federally, whether the circuits have split decisions, uh, and whether the federal question is such an important federal question that needs to be decided by the court. Right. So they look at those criteria and determine whether or not they want to hear the case. Right. And they'll grant certiorari or not. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Frank, let me go to you, because, uh, you know, you've been following this. Your entire law center is predicated on the facts that you want to see students be able to enjoy their First Amendment rights, even though they're incarcerated in schools. Obviously, a little tongue-in-cheek there, but, you know, we often say in some areas of the law, you check your rights at the door. In some ways, I mean, we're not going too far by saying not entirely, but students have been faced with that over the generations, have they not? Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you, you shouldn't actually uh, say it too tongue-in-cheek when you talk about the comparison between schools and prisons because 25 years ago, our Supreme Court decided a case called Hazelwood versus Kuhlmeyer, the Hazelwood case. And that case uh, gave schools the authority when students are writing in school-sponsored media like a newspaper or a yearbook to censor their speech based on what the Supreme Court called a legitimate pedagogical justification. And that wording was taken, in fact, directly straight out of a case involving the speech of prison inmates a year earlier in which the Supreme Court recognized that prison uh, wardens may censor inmate speech based on any legitimate penological justification. So, right. in so fact, the uh, rights of students and the rights of uh, prisoners have always been uh, hand in hand. And it's not an exaggeration to say that uh, the rights of students uh, aren't all that much terribly greater uh, in many contexts than those of uh, inmates and maximum some security institutions, sad to say. Uh, Frank, uh, every time the court has been asked to look, to, to make a direct analogy between prison rights and school rights, they've rejected it. For example, I was involved in one case called LRDR versus uh, Middlebucks Votech, in which that very argument was made with regard to a 1983 action. And the court, an en banc decision, rejected it. So I'm not so sure that we need to put uh, schools, public schools, in the context of prisons. Uh, I think that that's 
uh, that, that's putting a tone there that I don't think is fair. I don't think that schools are out to suppress student speech. And in this case particularly, all we are out to do is to maintain the authority, the ability to uh, maintain a level of student decorum, civility and discourse. Let's go back to the beginning. I think it really bears uh, raising this case, the Tinker case out of 1969. And, and, and even the kids today that are involved in the Eastern Area School District, this case is impacting what is going to happen with their case as well. This is a seminal case where two students, at least two students, came into schools during the Vietnam era and they, they decided to wear armbands. Here's the picture up on the screen and there you see the, old, the, the good old peace sign uh, that those of us who grew up in the 60s know all too well. And in that case, I guess it's one of the very first cases where the Supreme Court came down and said, we're going to rule specifically on student rights, what they can and what they cannot say. Sadly, it may be still the high water mark of student free speech rights cases, but it really was the genesis, was it not? Well, and, and I wouldn't say sadly. I, the Tinker Standard is, in fact, a tremendously protective standard. The, the court recognizes that. Atrophied over time. But. The, well, the court recognizes that you got to run a school. Right, And so the Tinker Standard simply says that as long as student speech doesn't disrupt the functioning of the school, you leave it alone. You don't punish it. You don't send the kid home. You don't make him turn his t-shirt inside out. You don't make the kid take off the armband. We have a few exceptions to that. Basically, the court has said, we're going to assume there's disruption. And the most recent case you've already mentioned is Morse v. Frederick. This was the, the case with the, the big banner uh, outside the school in Juneau, Alaska that said, bong hits for Jesus. And the principal thought that that was uh, promoting illegal drug use. And the court said, yeah, that probably was promoting illegal drug use. And that's just one of the things that's inconsistent with the functioning of a school. Um, and similarly, the case that's really at issue for us, the Supreme Court case of Bethel School, Vis uh, School District versus Fraser, when uh, young Mr. Fraser got up to nominate his classmate as class president um, and did so uh, with a speech that contained rather obvious and graphic se sexual metaphor uh, at length. And the court said that's another thing that just simply isn't consistent with the functioning of a school. You can forbid, forbid student speech that is lewd and obscene. I want to toss something at Frank because you're obviously a student of this kind of history, uh, Mr. Lamont, and it just seems to me that back in the 60s, I mean, young kids were going to, to Vietnam, they're putting their lives on the line, so when they came back home, it's like, well, we better give them the right to drink if they can carry a gun, and we better give them the right to vote if they're going to carry a gun. Don't you see that in a, in a school setting, kids are 17, 18, you know, they're, when they're seniors, they can even be 19. They want to wear wristbands and express themselves, we should do that. But those rights have atrophied over time, wouldn't you say? Yeah, I think what we have really is uh, a tale of two cities here. We have the best of times and the worst of times. Um, in the courts and in many of our state legislatures, we certainly have a drift toward hostility to the rights of students, and that's being pushed by um, some of uh, some of the school district attorneys um, that uh, would just as soon read the First Amendment out of existence in schools. That's the worst of times, but the best of times, and the fact of the matter is that um, in the education field, there's a growing consensus that can't be ignored anymore, that we have a deficit of meaningful civics education in our schools and that the solution to the deficit of civics education is to promote the wide open discussion of issues of public concern during school time and on school grounds. You can't do that in a heavily censored environment. Um, it's, it's the uh, recipe for civic disengagement. And that's what we're going to see if the Supreme Court would rule in favor of the Eastern Area School District here. What we'll see is schools unleashed to just bleach all discussion of issues of public public concern out of the school day in the name of keeping good order or not hurting people's feelings. Um, you know, in the Tinker case, the Supreme Court already struck a very sensible balance and a very sensible compromise where they told us that the school's authority starts when student speech starts to substantially and underline substantially disrupt the operations of the school day, but that just hurt feelings or differences of opinion uh, or conflicts were not enough because, frankly, that's why we have a First Amendment to entertain 
views that might be provocative. Um, the Tinker Rule has served us very well, and uh, let's hope that the Supreme Court, should it take this case, um, will continue to stand behind it, as I predict they will. At this point, uh, he has to say goodnight to us. Frank Lamont, Executive Director for the Student Press Law Center in Arlington, Virginia. Mr. Lamont, thanks so much tonight. Thanks for having me. You know, the, the court Thanks. has well summed this up in the past on more than one occasion um, by referring to another very important Supreme Court case, right, Cohen v. California, in which a gentleman was initially charged criminally for wearing a, a jacket into a courthouse uh, that criticized the, the draft in words that I can't say on broadcast TV. And what the court has said is that uh, the First Amendment allows a student to to wear Tinker's armband, but not Cohen's jacket. And our argument here that is... That was the F the draft, wasn't it? That's right. Okay. The jacket See, says F the draft. All right. <laughs> so, he says he, wears, he has a jacket that says F the draft. Right. And, right. and the Supreme Court says you can't uh, stop that when he's an adult out in public. You can stop that in the school. That doesn't belong in a school. Right. But there's a far cry. Between boobies and F. Between F the draft and a breast cancer awareness cause bracelet right. that and says I heart question. boobies. All right, let me ask, uh, ask a question. So does intention count? If, this, if the kids are not in school promoting cancer awareness and they just want to have armbands or wristbands that say I heart boobies, does your case fail? No. No, the question isn't what the kids intended. So you knew she was going to say that, John. But right. said it before. <laughs> right. I, it, it, it isn't a question of the kids trying to dress something up uh, in, or, or, you know, when you say that you can't wear Cohen's jacket. Cohen's jacket had a very socially important message, a politically important message. Right. But he used a vulgarity. But it, you, he used a vulgarity. You still can't do that in school just because it's part of a cause. Right. And you couldn't say F cancer. You couldn't have a bracelet that says F cancer. Well, that would be, okay. you know, that would be well, a Well, we've game. got some of those wristbands right here in the studio tonight. I'm, I'm sure Thank you, you do. Yes. But yeah. it, the thing is, <laughs> that uh, when you have, the question is, what is the message that's conveyed? And courts look at this question all the time, right? It is, is someone addressing a matter of public concern in, in the First Amendment establishment context. We ask, what is the message that is conveyed? And when you look at the history of this case, these girls, these bracelets in this middle school, there were hundreds of kids wearing these bracelets without a single incident at least before the school decided to ban them, of anybody behaving inappropriately or treating them as anything other than breast cancer awareness bracelets. Okay. But F, but F cancer, you'd have problems with as well. Yeah, the school okay. can ban that. All right, yeah. well, there you go. Well, I'm going to have to go ahead and disagree with the facts. Uh, I think we, we, we did have uh, a, a number of reports of boys going up to girls saying, I love boobies, you know, booby, booby, booby was one. And this uh, is just not true. Well, it's just not in the record. It's, I'm and, sorry. And, it's, it's not. not. Neither is hundreds of people wearing these bracelets. I, that's uh, what the girls testified. That's The girls also testified that uh, they did not intend to support breast cancer. They wanted to wear uh, these bracelets because they were colorful and the other girls had them. No, the so girls not, both testified about how much they learned about breast cancer. They looked things up on the Internet, yeah. learned about how young you could be and get breast cancer. Yeah, the, let me say that the real question is who decides who decides what is lewd and obscene and so forth? And sure, ultimately, it could be a court. But the court needs to recognize, and it, it does give lip service, in fact, to the idea that, that local uh, school authorities need to be given deference to run their schools, to be able to identify uh, what is appropriate and inappropriate given the grade level and the circumstance. The dress code prohibits articles of clothing that contain sexual double entendre. The, uh, the principal, who by the way is herself a breast cancer survivor, uh, was alerted to these by complaints by some of the girls, uh, also complaints by some of, the, some of the faculty members who also are breast cancer survivors and felt that this kind of a campaign trivialize their experience. Don't you think that he's got a problem with the whole notion of Frazier and the vulgarity where there are a lot of double entendres where uh, today in 2013 and 2014 
we're looking at a word that seems innocuous, that's used almost commonly by, by young girls of almost every age. Well, that's not just today. I mean, let me tell you, girls of all ages have talked about their own boobies with each other, with their mothers, with their grandmothers. But you know this full is well just, I in mean, the 60s this, and 70s that they, that, 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 that John would have won back in 78 or 79. Because back in 78 or 79, women weren't allowed to talk about their bodies using any language. And in fact, the teachers at John's school initially testified they didn't think it was appropriate for 13-year-olds to use the word breast. This is the problem with school administrators having so much deference that they can decide that things are improper. I, and it's not just this school. We represented a second grader this year who was punished for using the word penis in an accurate fashion when some kid said, uh, uh, this is my wee-wee, and the kid says, no, this is your penis. He was sent home for that. The fact is that kids of this age talk about important things, and they need to talk about their own health, they talk about political issues, they talk about social issues, and when they do that in a manner that is not conveying a lewd message, is not disrespectful to anyone, that's exactly the kind of speech the First Amendment should be protecting. And so that opens the door for every uh, body part to be paraded on a bracelet, a t-shirt. And by the way, Chris, a lot of these bracelets are co-branded with commercial advertising. It's a sneaky way for advertisers to get in their message to young, vulnerable audiences. Let's, let's create a titillating, you know, sort of sexually exciting little phrase. Get it in there in the guise of the First Amendment and let's sell uh, girls' clothing, um, ski, out, ski things, toys, what have you. Well, it certainly poses a conundrum for this Supreme Court because they never saw a commercial free speech argument that they didn't love, except maybe <laughs> when it's weighed against their own sense of morality. So it'll be interesting to see what Antonin Scalia and the majority of the court do with this kind of a case if it does reach the U.S. Supremes, because you're right, there could be a commercial free speech issue here, could there not be? Yes, in fact, uh, we raise that. Uh, whether or not we'll raise it uh, on cert petition, I don't know, but uh, we, we, did, we did make that argument uh, before the Third Circuit. There are other cases like this in the country. I mean, North Dakota's got some, I think they've got something just like this. I mean, in the, in the very same term, boobies. So, I mean, it's, it's out there. You know what, you, you keep saying that this is, the whole point of this is that it's a cause bracelet, right? It's a rubber bracelet, recognizable just like the Livestrong bracelets, the kidney bracelets, etc. Right. It's a cause bracelet. It doesn't say boobies. It says, I heart boobies, keep abreast. And on okay. the inside, it's got the, the, the slogan of the Keep Abreast Foundation. Okay. And, I, and I gotta tell you, these girls are not focusing on this as uh, a way to talk about their breasts and get away with it. This was a conversation was, about breast is, cancer. All I'm saying is that yeah. this is an issue that has, you know, has arisen in other school districts across the country. You're not surprised by that, especially maybe even in more conservative areas of the country. And again, North Dakota was was one of those. But let, take a look here. What we've got some of the th things on the screen. There's your F cancer. All right. So here's the here's the F cancer, and, and and you would agree with this. The school has every right to just toss this, correct? Yes. Okay. Good. But what about some of these other ones? And I, and again, I'm not saying a slippery slope argument is a strong one. But you know it comes up. It's already come up. It's going to come up if it goes to the Supremes. Where does the line get crossed, even for an ACLU member who's representing two children at the Eastern School District? Well, the question is going to be, what are you understanding, and what is that community understanding from the bracelet, from the T-shirt, from the speech of any sort, and how it's being presented? I, as, as John has pointed out, uh, m uh, young Mr. Fraser didn't use a single four-letter word, mm -hmm. but the meaning of his speech was quite clear to everyone there. You didn't like that decision, though, did you? You thought they went too far, right? The Supremes went too far. It depends on what part of the decision you're reading, because when you read the part of the decision that says this was a lewd, graphic representation of sex that does not belong, certainly in a school assembly, mm -hmm. I'm completely with you. When the court then goes on, starts talking about 
uh, things that are objectionable and the school can sort of police the environment. I don't know where that stops. And I'll tell you, in the most recent school speech case, Morse v. Frederick, the Supreme Court also pulled back on that language, said, no, that, that banner, bong hits for Jesus, you can't censor it under Fraser. That's not what offensive right. means under Fraser. No. And Justice Alito said, in fact, let's be really clear, we're recognizing another other very narrow category of speech that's an exception to the Tinker Standard. I see. So again, so it had nothing to do with vulgarity, but they said in the Morse case, again, they said it had something to do with to, to do with drugs. I know plaintiffs argued otherwise. That failed. I know you don't like that case. I know the ACLU doesn't like that 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 kind of a case. And you probably see that as, you know, another chink in the armor of student free speech. I mean, we talked about the erosion. But you're, you're, yeah, you're no, don't, 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 don't put me in the same boat with Frank. I mean, I actually think that uh, okay. in, uh, and I'm sorry, Frank, uh, but <laughs> I actually think that the cases protecting student speech as they are pronounced by the Supreme Court, other than Fraser, which is full of all kinds of ambiguity itself, I don't know how you can say the new Third Circuit standard is less clear than Fraser, because Fraser's quite unclear as to what it means. But apart from that one, they are very specific restrictions, very specific exceptions right. that otherwise preserve the general rule of student speech. I think the law from the Supreme Court is very strong. I think that the way it's been you applied... You think Tinker still, st still stands? See, I think it's more like Roe versus Wade. Women still have the rights to abortion, but it's been ratcheted back and ratcheted back. Well, I will yep. tell you, not in the Third Circuit. The Third okay. Circuit ha there has probably more than any of the other circuits still yeah. maintains a very strong standard right. and very strong protection right. for student speech in part because of the work of now Justice Alito when he was on this court. Interesting. Well, John. Let, let me say this, Chris. That Third Circuit decision uh, in this case has essentially opened a door, opened the school doors uh, to any kind of sexual phrase that you could attach a cause to. And in fact, if you go through uh, some of those bracelets that uh, I pointed out, the court discusses in its opinion the various different uh, uh, causes that the, you, the audience can just imagine for testicular cancer, ovarian cancer, uh, and so forth and so on, uh, there are slang phrases for all those body parts mm -hmm. that simply have no business in middle school, where you have kids of different ages of development, um, and essentially, you know, what the court has, has done is, I think, taken a much clearer standard and made it, made it much less clear. Uh, one other important point here is that uh, the court, uh, both the district court and the, uh, the circuit court, uh, f tried to focus on the word boobies. It's not the word. It is the sentence, I love boobies. And in fact, if I were a better actor, I could make an inflection that said, you know, I love boobies and mean something entirely differently. I mean, the, the sexual double entendre suggesting a prurient interest in the female breast is undeniable. And uh, from the point of view of the school administrator, uh, there ought to be the capability of regulating that, of minimizing a hypersexualized environment, and in fact, protecting girls uh, and boys as well from an unnecessarily an unnecessary sexualization of their environment. I there are other ways to say the same thing. It was uh, breast, can breast Cancer Awareness Day when this happened, which is a real irony. Yeah, it's really funny because uh, I don't know what is so obviously prurient about the the I heart moniker. I, do people express a prairie interest when they say I heart New York, when they've got a bumper, sa a d bumper sticker that says I heart my husky, I heart my horse? It's That's really, really it, not it, what the, the obvious connotation is of that phrase. If you're a seventh grade middle schooler, it is. In fact, if you are uh, slightly older and maybe still have a middle school fixation, uh, it is as well. I mean, look at the interest that's been brought to this case. This case has been in Playboy. The, 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 um, uh, the, the testimony was that porn stars wanted to co-brand with this. I mean, you cannot deny there is a sexual component <laughs> I, to I this. don't think that's dispositive, Attorney Freud. Let me read you what Dahlia <laughs> Lithwick said in uh, Slate not long ago. She said that the I Heart Boobies case could decide the fate of free speech for students. Is, she, is that hyperbolic or is she right on? 
I would say that's hyperbolic. Okay. I, I right. think there's a lot of protection for, for students uh, and, and student speech. Um, and this case uh, actually could finally clarify the rules around words that can be misinterpreted. Mm -hmm. I'll give you an example, a case from another circuit. Girl comes to school wearing a shirt that says, drugs suck. No one understands that as a reference to fellatio. But that's the basis on which she was sent home because she wouldn't take home the mm. take off the shirt. Now, I have to cover this before we do leave tonight, John. The editorial in the Express Times at the end of October 1031 said the Eastern Area School Board didn't show much respect for the public, however, in adding this decision to its meeting agenda at the last minute. The community has shown a lot of interest in this issue. People should have had more notice to weigh in before the board voted to ask the Supreme Court to get involved. Your comment? Well, there is a, an exception to the Sunshine Law that al allows for the discussion of litigation. Um, I, you know, typically we don't discuss our litigation strategy in the public, uh, and we didn't do that here either. We didn't think that'd be fair to the school district. Um, at, this case has a little bit more um, wide interest than many of the cases that that we appeal. Uh, as a matter of day-to-day uh, -day business. Uh, I want to thank both John Freund and uh, Mary Catherine Roper for being here tonight. It's not usual that I get two attorneys on the set who have argued a case and continue to argue it and may argue it <laughs> before uh, the highest court in the land. If it does go to the next step, where will we see the two of you? Will you be up there at the, at the rostrum? Oh, I, I have no idea. Obviously, I'll be at the table, but I uh, don't know uh, who would be arguing the case. Gotcha. John, what about you? Well, uh, we've had uh, quite a few calls from across the country that uh, lawyers were very interested in taking this case on. Um, I was asked the same question by a reporter the other day, and um, uh, as much as I uh, would love to get in there and argue the case before the Supreme Court, uh, I'll do what's... Um, I'll do what's in the best interest of the client. Uh, I noticed we had, uh, you know, a real high flyer like Ken Starr argue the Morse case. Mm -hmm. You know, if we get another high flyer to argue this case, uh, we might have to step aside. But right. uh, I'm hoping Boys and Olsen or, or I'm or I'm, I'm hoping that I can be in there um, uh, punching away to uh, to uh, argue our our position. We'll, well see. thank you both. Thanks for being here tonight. And look how civil. See, we do this all the time. Collegial <laughs> adversaries, but collegial. John Freud from Kings Bry. Herman Freund and Fall, the chair of the Education Law Practice Group there, solicitor for the Eastern Area Schools, and Mary Catherine Roper with the ACLU in Philadelphia, both returning to the set. It's great to see you both. And we also had Frank Lamont on earlier this evening, the executive director for the Student Press Law Center in Arlington, Virginia, joining us from CNN in D.C. We thank him. And for all of us here at the American Law Journal, thanks for joining us this week. Until next week, case closed. Tonight's American Law Journal has been made possible in part by Scheller PC, a nationally recognized personal injury law firm protecting individuals against dangerous pharmaceutical medicine, including antidepressants, antipsychotic drugs, defective products and medical devices, and other personal injury matters. Blank Rome, a national multi-practice firm with more than 400 attorneys in 10 offices. Blank Rome's highly regarded employment law practice has provided strategic workplace advice to employers for over 60 years. And the Legal Intelligencer, the nation's oldest legal newspaper for lawyers.